Hey yo, time to talk to a ward again. <laughs> Welcome back to another one of Matt Jerkhold's reading updates. Um, this is for the month of October, which is rightly known as uh, the, the month of spooky season, hence I got my buddy over there hanging still. I'm here to talk about some spooky scary literature. <laughs> We got four books to talk about and maybe a little bit uh, about an, a literary event I've been at. I visited the, the big old uh, world largest book fair in Frankfurt with my friend Lala, um, who has been on this channel before. Them and I, we've been, we, we went to that book fair this year. But I, I, more about that later. I want to talk about the actual books that I've read first all right four books to talk about all of them very spooky scary this first book that i'm going to be talking about uh granted i honestly read it mostly last month it almost made it in the previous vlog but like you know i already filmed it when i finished the book it doesn't matter it's gonna be in this one here now and this one deals with one of the scariest things of all time uh, uh, walking in retail because this is Convenience Store Woman by Sayaka Murata. I think this book uh, definitely had a lot of positive critical acclaim when it came out. I think it came out just a couple years ago too. It's pretty fresh and it's been pretty popular online, I believe. Uh, I picked it up mostly because I was <clears throat> just in the mood for Japanese literary fiction. Just, I was just uh, wanting a little bit of a story, a little bit of a slice of life regular story about someone's life in Japan and this one gave me that because convenience store woman is as the title suggests about a woman who lives a simple life dedicated to a job at a convenience store where she's been working for like most of her life uh, which she is content and happy with because she feels that's the place where she belongs uh, the book deals uh, heavily with themes of society's expectations of one another or people's expectations of one another in society. A lot of stereotypes and things. And, like There are conflicts in this where even though she, the protagonist, is very happy in her in an arguably dead-end job where she isn't ever like rising to new horizons or chasing a new uh, goal or whatever. She's doing her job every day in and day out, uh, a very regular life that she likes. She enjoys her life that way. But of course, other people think. Um, I, whatever. She's a woman, she should prepare to have a family or like she should be striving for something more and not be stuck in a job like this for years on end. There's, there's commentary on this notion that many like people in general often don't want other people to be happy but rather to be normal as whatever they perceive as normal really playing on like the typical stereotypical like life developments that people usually expect somebody would should go through um when that's not always the life that works for everybody some people just want their one simple singular environment in which they feel able and capable and stay there and they don't need to achieve change or strive for something more throughout their life things like that there's also again a lot about gender stereotypes not only because of her who is a single woman i mean japan is a very um conservative 
country, generally speaking. And so a lot of people in this book have the notion of, you're a woman getting old, you should be bearing children, what the heck? That's a theme that's covered, but also mm, the masculine side of that with a male character who is very unhappy with himself and the world, basically a sort of incel spouting the same dumb nonsense as an incel would, but the story which can be grating and annoying and that character does make up quite a lot of time throughout the book as it uh, as the protagonist interacts with him but it also the book takes that character and uses it as another like sort of um, character study to see what these uh, stereotypical expectations might uh, from society at large might do with somebody who doesn't actually f fulfills them or feels like he fits them it's all about that sort of thing but uh, and it's a fine book i didn't think it was great yet yeah, the, the subject matter was relatable the main character was likable um it was all good and dandy it's a short book too didn't blow me away or anything but it was a comfortable little read for the most part but i think the most remarkable thing about this at least that's how i that's at least that's what i took from it it um has the notion that growth character growth doesn't necessarily have to mean change and this story i feel like used it to a decent point so now that we have the horror of retail work and society's expectations behind us the next terrifying notion is um, debatably much more dangerous because now we're going to be talking about the end of the world specifically about uh, the results of humanity's neglect of planet earth speaking in terms of climate change pollution environmental damage that whole thing because all of that is a subject in David Brin's Earth. I don't know how this is gonna turn out. Excuse me if I'm rambling about this one too much but this was genuinely a big thick book um, which is kind of also the reason why I read it in the first place I guess I read relatively much a lot of books but I usually don't read thick books long books pretty sure uh, most of the books I'm reading are like below 300 pages I guess I have a sort of like big book uh, commitment issue or whatever I rarely I rarely grab the thick ones for one reason or another has always been like that whatever this is something that I've I guess tried to change for years now and I've been doing that gradually whatever I'm reading more lengthier books these days but this book in particular David Brin's Earth <laughs> was a personal milestone I guess because it's like a 700 plus page chunky um, which for me is quite a lot actually in fact it is the longest book I've read in my life so far and I'm not not trying to make this sound like anything special because people all around the globe read books this size regularly like it's a like it's nothing it's a normal thing readers be reading fake books it's just for me it's factually the longest book i've read so far and i am a bit proud of myself or i'm just happy that i actually started it and stuck with it and finished it honestly when i read when i started this the estimate of how long it would take me to finish it was more like uh, end of the year 
especially with like the bookly app that I'm using to to gather my reading time, which also spits out like an estimate of how long it will take you to read. After the first couple pages, it was telling me something like. Uh, 30 minutes each day will get me done with the book at uh, like New Year's Day, something like that. But as I began to reading it, as I began loving this book and really being engaged by this book and also real life circumstances helped me read more daily because my daily commute was like doubled or tripled for a couple of weeks this month which therefore also had let me read more each day. This combination of having more time to read and actually loving this book really boosted my reading speed, I guess. And I finished this book in the term of a month instead of taking at least two months, which was always already surprising to me. All of that aside, nobody cares about my stupid petty milestone of reading a thick book. David Burns Earth is a great novel in my opinion. I wouldn't call it a perfect novel, but it's definitely one of the most enjoyable ones I've read in my life. And I admire it for many f reasons. And it will probably be in my head for a while as well. The basic premise starts with the idea that an artificial tiny black hole accidentally falls into the core of the earth, threatening to destroy our planet from the inside out. That's just like the beginning incident to start the story. The book is about more than just this black hole situation. In general, it is just completely and totally about humanity's effect on the planet in terms of, like I said, climate change, the environmental destruction and um, where it all leads us. The further the environment declined and humanity uh, exploited it, it, the more it also affected the zeitgeist and the cultures and how people live. And this book is set in the near future, in the year 2038, where um, the world is changed accordingly. It has a very, very strong focus on these eco themes, uh, which are obviously very well researched and like only exaggerated at points for the sake of the story, but they are all based on real life facts in the first place. And this book was written in the late 80s, published in 1990. It tells a story about the year 2038 and therefore makes a lot of very intelligent speculations of it, about this future. Which spans from things like a version of the internet that aged very well and is used very well for this, uh, for like gradual exposition and world building. It talks about the, the changing popularity of religions and the growth of more naturalist religions and groups. They even one of my favorite little bits of world building in this is a juvenile gang that celebrates the sun's destruction of the earth due to the declining ozone layer. Like that sort of thing is just so cool. Surveillance state stuff in there as well, though maybe not in the way that you think it is. There's whole sections about the story where like the old people use all sorts of technology to surveil their environment, especially the young people, while the young people are more yearning for a time where there was actual privacy and things like that. Um, a lot of really interesting themes. And this book plainly called Earth. It is a story that genuinely spans the entire globe, including the inner core of the planet and the outer orbit. Um, and it is a an accomplishment in itself to span a story that has its characters located around the entire planet with many different characters that eventually like cross paths and so on. 
uh, and not have it be convoluted or dull uh, or tedious rather it is it is an accomplishment to have that in its own then the entire genuinely clever world building with like hard science eco themes is just a cherry on top and i adored this i really fucking loved this obviously uh, at 700 something pages there are obviously moments here and there that could totally be shortened or cut out without the whole really losing a lot so it isn't a perfect book or whatever and also the ending the ending is good and interesting it throws up interesting themes and questions uh, in its own right i was secretly hoping for a different pathway though <laughs> which would have been even cooler in my opinion but that's not what i got still what actually is going on is still interesting and cool and i was still engaged until the very end so i can't really complain there are definitely some elements in this book that i didn't see coming going into this until they happened yeah this was fantastic i fucking love this book and it really really made me want to look for more eco sci-fi for more science fiction especially hard sci-fi that actually takes into account and examines the way we exploit and destroy our environment really looking at the nature of things like the the nature of society i guess but also actual nature the environment it really incorporates that into a science fiction setting that is such an interesting thing which also like all of these are very real things global warming uh, is a very real thing and we experience the results of that like more and more with each day right which also makes reading this book now probably get, feels different than reading it back in the 90s when it was first published i mean we are now in the year 2023 we are closer to the like 2038 the year that this fictional story takes place in we are closer to that than the actual time that this book was written in and um when this book talks about how the environmental change is genuinely f changing the way we live and threatening our existence um talking about the different generations generational debt that a generation leaves to the next things like that it has a completely different layer reading it now where we are closer to the results of these things than when it was first published probably but it's also it's not a bummer it's not honestly if it was if it was me that wrote it i probably wrote it much more as a bummer as a much less hopeful <laughs> i would have gone in a different direction but this book is actually like it is it is direct it is um sad i guess maybe shocking it is definitely uh, also a bit thought provoking it is real in that sense not that it is like it is still fiction of course but it is real in that sense that it takes these themes seriously uh, but it's still not completely hopeless it's not a hopeless story and it's not aiming to make our real future seem hopeless with all the things that are going on and that we or previous generations have caused to the planet our home which i mean this also ex in includes a very good like afterward introduction by the author where he talks about these things who seems to be genuinely very passionate about all these things and learned he definitely read a lot of a lot of things he did his research you know and it's it makes I guess it, this package whole having the voice behind this fictional story also acknowledge these things in real life without diminishing hope while still taking it seriously it's just a good book i really recommend this this was great 
great hard sci-fi. At least I think this counts as hard sci-fi. I don't have that much uh, experience with this stuff. I believe this counts as hard, hard sci-fi with a very prominent, cool and creative focus on eco themes and a genuinely just very engaging story. This was great. I love this book. I'm very glad I did pick this up and didn't let the 700 pages scare me away or whatever. It was, this was really nice. So, that was the biggest book that we're going to be talking about and arguably also the book with the heaviest themes or whatever because the next spooky edition in our October vlog deals uh, with dentistry. Because we all hate going to the dentist, I assume. At least that's a phobia that I have. <laughs> this is gonna be a really quick one. We're talking about Tooth Trouble, also known as Tusk Trouble, I believe, by Cecilia Johansson. M though I read the German copy called Keine Angst vom Zahnarzt Wilbert. My whole life I had a phobia of dentists, I still have a phobia of dentistry to a certain degree for sure, which also had me uh, uh, neglect dentists uh, for years. I haven't gone to the doctor in years, to the dentist, and in late September I finally jumped over my own shadow and got a dentist appointment which led into several more dentist appointments too, um, where I paid for my sins over the years. Um, I've had 10 appointments in the last two months, so I was really busy with that, with that drill in my teeth. But I'm pretty much almost done now, and on my previous appointment this week, I had some more time than usual in the wait in the waiting room at the dentist's office and I picked up this cute little children's book that was next to me on the table and read it in five minutes or whatever. So there's not really much to talk about. This is though um, we need more wa walrus xenofiction in literature. <laughs> this cannot be the only one man. <laughs> we need more books about walruses from the point of view of viruses. <laughs> this one had it, I guess, because this one is about a walrus kid who got a toothache and needs to be talked in going to the dentist, where it turns out to be a good idea. And after that, the boy is no more afraid of dentists. You know, very typical children's story. You can see where this is going from the cover art alone, you know, whatever. Neat, neat art about these walrus characters. I liked it. Nothing like super special if you're an adult, I guess, whatever. But like for five minutes in a dentist's office, I guess this was fine. <laughs> no, there's no reason to read this if you don't have kids yourself or whatever. But like, as a happenstance, read at the at a, in a waiting room i'm not complaining this was fine yeah neat little book i guess that's it that's it and now with that terrifying subject out of the way we come to the conclusion of my four book vlog we are talking about the terrifying Honestly, I've, I'm making jokes about these horror subjects in books that aren't horror books, horror genre books. But this book, this final book now, is the only one that actually belongs to the genre of horror. Also terrifying because it's bad. <laughs> what's what's more, what's scarier than a shitty book? <laughs> what's scarier than a franchise novelization? 
that sucks. <laughs> I don't. Nothing about this book was a good idea, honestly. I had to read this on the fucking Kindle app because I couldn't find it anywhere else, so I read this shit on my phone. Not a fan of that. The cover art also is so bad. This is Fear by Dominic Kristen. Looking at the cover art, which is like super generic and badly edited, like stock imagery of like a horror trope with the little girl, or whatever, um, you might not immediately recognize what the fuck this is about. Though, if you would, sp if you would be able to speak German and read what's on my screen here, it also says translated um, based on the video game with the same name. And yes, maybe you know what this is talking about, and it, it's uh, the bell just ringed in your head, and your eyebrows went up or down <laughs> in disbelief. Because, yeah, you heard right, this is a book, a novelization that only ever released in Germany and nowhere else, based on the horror first person shooter that is Fear. So it's attempting to turn this To a compelling novel. <laughs> now here's the thing. The Fear games, especially the first one which came out in 2005, I believe. Fear is a great horror shooter that was amazing at the time. It aged a bit, of, of, it of course aged a bit, but even revisiting it um, like earlier this year, I still totally loved it. It's still so much fun. I have a special knack for it, I have a lot of nostalgia for it, because this was... Uh, Fear was one of my most prominent early touching grounds with the horror genre. I, I was a teenager when it came out, and a childhood friend had it, and I absolutely adored Fear. I pissed my pants a million times while playing it or watching my friend play it. And it's undoubtedly Fear and The Ring, which both share some similar horror genre tropes. Um, both of these things definitely, undoubtedly um, influenced my developing tastes in a way that I still, that are still lingering now in my adult life. I still like a lot of elements that were introduced through these two things when I was a kid, a teenager or whatever. Fear is a great stupid, bloody, grimy action shooter full of bullet time, gore and uh, stupid, powerful weapons where you go through people like they are juice bags um, with some funny, badly aged, corny ass horror tropes all around for the vibe. And I read the German Wikipedia article. I see it mentions this novelization and that's where I found out about this and at first I thought this might have been official merch or something but it doesn't now that I've read it I don't think it is at all this just seems like a book 
that some dude wrote like like soft fan fiction using all the franchise elements all the names all the copyrighted things and with any disregard to copyright infringement or grammatical errors uh, just put it out there um, I'm, it, it has both been printed as well as like re-released as an ebook. It is currently available on Amazon, re-released earlier this year. But it's been out for like 10 years already. And there are somewhere, there are physical copies of this somewhere as well. Only available in German. It was never translated because why would, why would it be? There's no way there was ever like a professional editor that looked over this text or something. This was just some dude writing it and putting it out there for some reason. And I wish, I wish I could ask this Dominic Christen why. <laughs> I thought it was a curious case. Again, like I said, in the beginning I thought this might have been an official piece of merch, which would have been interesting to read because it's such a... Uh, fear is not really something that would scream for novelization, if anything. Uh, so I was drawn in by that notion, though the more I read, the clearer it was from, to me that it wasn't an official thing at all. Though I had to finish it, obviously. It's still an enigma to me, it's still a weird thing. But it's, it's also not good. <laughs> With the fear games, the story, the plot, the lore, Probably not its strongest element. It's pretty nonsensical, full of stupid tropes. And you, like, if you go through these games with even a single brain cell left online, you will have a hard time taking any of that seriously. The story is not its main draw. The, the games are popular because of the vibe and the gameplay. I'm convinced that there are enough interesting tech horror paranormal shenanigan elements in the games that a skilled writer could probably flesh them out and spin them into a genuinely interesting novel. That is definitely something that could happen if talent is at play, but this author does, is not that. This author is not on that skill level or cares to do that. Well, that's maybe a bit mean. Fact is, I don't think the author managed to successfully write a good book. <laughs> it's not a long book either. I thought this would be a really quick read during October spooky season time, whatever. But I, it took me a whole month to get through this because it was such a slog and I really had to force myself to read this. Um, I mean, through the entire thing, I was um, morbidly curious, I guess, how you would turn this game into a book, but it was never actually captivating. Part of that is, the first half or whatever of this book, for the most part, felt like very dull literary fiction of a, like an ex-cop trying to get his life in order, including fixing a troubled relationship with an ex-girlfriend. This ex-girlfriend subplot especially takes up so much time of the like first half of the book. I, I went into this novelization of a an over-the-top action horror shooter expecting over-the-top action and like funny cool horror tropes or whatever. But I got half a book of awkward romance trouble, including a very clunky 10-page sex scene. And obviously there's no problem with sex in literature, but this didn't feel justified in this, and it wasn't well written either. And I really just wanted to get to the guns and the ghosts. <laughs> When, it, when we finally get to that point where the actual elements from the game show up more actively, when we finally get to the actual elements of the game with the shooty bang, bullet time, slow motion, gore shit, it's mildly entertaining, at least relative to the fucking dull ass exposition. 
though honestly what what was most interesting to me were like the little details of gameplay elements that the author decided to add to the book the way he decided to implement them like for example going through the game there's optional pieces of lore that you can collect uh, by listening to answering machines in the office environments like these things are all throughout the game and you can collect a bunch of them um, not actual substantial to the game just like a bit of extra bonus content a collectible and the author I, it gave me a good chuckle when the protagonist in an office building in an empty office building all of a sudden goes on this like almost tangent about how he notices all these answering machines with blinking lights and then had the odd urge to listen to them all for no really good reason and i just knew yeah okay the the author just took this this very much video game element and tried to implement it into this book without really it needing to be there but it was funny it gave me a good chuckle if you were to read this book without the context of the game that would be strange the way it was written and introduced honestly another thing it's interesting to read a novel where the character shoots people and then takes the ammunition and really makes sure to account the for the exact number of bullets that he's gathering from these corpses just like in a video game where you <laughs> walk over the defeated enemies and it uh, raises your ammunition counter because you're collecting the ammunition from these evil npcs again it gave me a chuckle because i can see where it's coming from it, with the video game gameplay element but it's so odd in the context of literature <laughs> i liked these bits and pieces this is the, honestly the stuff that i thought most interesting because the story and the way the author writes aren't the the plot of the story it spins together a bunch of the actual story bits from the game but again it doesn't really matter it was never the strong point of the series it i guess it served its purpose or whatever but really not anything to write home about and the way the author writes is like in a really flat tone i don't think he has a good voice as a writer it's really dull it's very repetitive the motherfucker has no idea how punctuation works and obviously has no regard for actual grammar <laughs> the more the further you get into the book um, you can actually see how grammatical errors become more and more i guess because i guess he gave a shit at the beginning and then stopped halfway through or like he made an effort to clean up the beginning but then stopped maybe he thought nobody would get this far or whatever though the final nail in the coffin for this book the final nail in this coffin is that the author never once mentions either the shotgun or the nail gun in this book two weapons that are incredibly prominent and iconic in the game and two weapons for which this game for a lot of people is still remembered for if you have played this game or know about the franchise in general it is crazy <laughs> to have anything about fear that doesn't feature at least one of these tools <laughs> obviously there's other weapons obviously you don't have to use these two weapons but this is for a lot of people what this game is remembered for uh, arguably the shotgun is one of the best weapons in first person shooter history
This is the scariest monster in the game, the VK-12 Combat Shotgun. You may have seen it before in every list of best video game shotguns on the internet. It's in the top five, easily. Maybe it's not as powerful as the Super Shotgun from Doom 2, but it sure feels like it is. And the nail gun is just iconic as heck. How can you write a whole ass book about this without having either of these at least once? And what the fuck? Anyway, this book wasn't good. This was this was really hard to get through. Ironically, as you can see on the time table thing, wherever I put it on the screen, it took me like seven hours and six minutes or something. Which is honestly criminal considering that this wasn't actually a long book in terms of pages, but here we are. And it's ironic that my actual playthrough time of the game is just 20 minutes longer. <laughs> it's kind of funny how close this was. But getting through the book was a lot harder than getting through the game. I can tell you that much. That was my four reads in October. And now I guess I can ramble on about a little bit about the Frankfurt Book Fair, uh, world's largest book fair that happens every year. I think this was like the 75th uh, anniversary or whatever. I've been there before once, also with my friend Lala, who, again, who you might know from other videos on my channel like the uh, Phasmophobia series. My pronouns are they them. I like raccoons, uh, red pandas, uh, very good animals, enjoy my German accent. Oh, we, ha we have a team name. Oh yeah, we're the Gilf Hunters, by the way. We're the Gilf Hunters. Ghost, I, I'd like to find. find. Right. <laughs> We went there like a bunch of years ago once, but I was really into the idea of going there again this year. And I asked them if they wanted to go with me again. And 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 so we did, so we planned a fun little weekend at the book fair. And it was great. I had a I had a great time there. We both had a great time there. Really glad we did that. Yeah, we we we, we watched a couple um presentations we had some expensive food we waded through oceans of human bodies and uh, we got a bunch of books too even though you don't really go to the book fair to buy books um, like there's the Sunday where you buy books I guess where where there's an actual the shopping day is the Sunday we were there on Saturday though and most and that's mostly just you know for not buying but for looking and for talking and for seeing and for the events and whatever but we still got some loot and i'm excited to show you what i got i got a bunch of stuff flyers pamphlets ads whatever i grabbed a bunch of stuff there for the interesting bunch of knickknacks but um really the only thing that really matters here is uh two books which I'm thrilled to show. Let's start with the one that doesn't really have a backstory. There's a lot of opportunity, opportunities to grab like some free stuff and some people, some, I don't know, some organizations even put out like whole books just to, for grabs. And at one point, I don't even know where this book came from. I think this was just put on a stand in the middle of an aisle by nobody. Um, but I saw it and I looked around to see if anybody was there that could tell me if it was free or not. And since there was no one there, I just took it. And uh, this is something I'm very excited to read and talk about in the future. Oh, this is gonna be in the December vlog. I already, I just realized it makes complete sense. I'm gonna be talking about this in this December vlog. Mark my words. This is the Manga Messias. Messias. It's German. 
it's a German combi, Manga Messias. And it's, from what I gathered, genuinely what it looks like. It's the story of Jesus H. Christ as an, as an epic manga. And I'm excited to read this. Like, why the, why the heck, why the heck would you give out the Bible, the dusty old ass Bible in the church, when you could just give this to the kiddies and have them all immediately be, um, you know, baptized at will. <laughs> Um, also, like, note, my cynical ass thought this would be, like, some western publisher or whatever, just, like, faking the manga aesthetic to be hip with the kids or whatever, but no, this seems to be a genuine Japanese creation. So at least they got that of authenticity. Looking forward to this. <laughs> so now that we have that religious totem stacked away for later, I have another religious totem to show you with a little bit more of a backstory. The last time my friend Lala and I visited the book fair a, a bunch of years ago, we visited the Scientology booth, the publisher that prints out all of L. Ron Hubbard's wacky texts, has a booth at the book fair. And especially back then, I was really interested in Scientology, not because I like endorsed their bullshit or wanted to join them, but because I find cults interesting and Scientology is like an incredibly interesting, weird organization. So back then, I went to the Scientology booth talked a little bit of nonsense with one of the people there, ate all of their snacks. They had some like salmon bread, salmon on bread snack thingy. Was really nice. I ate them all and then fucking left. <laughs> and that was my greatest achievement there. Um, so now that we went back to the book fair, I thought, hey, Lala, my friend, we gotta check out the Scientologists again. I need more snacks. And so we did. We went to the booth straight ahead. I had it all marked in my little app. <laughs> but to my dismay, I saw there were no snacks this year. My heart bled a little. I was very sad, but nonetheless, I checked out their shelves because why the fuck not? Uh, I mean, the thing is, they they had L. Ron Hubbard's actual Scientology induction books in there, but also L. Ron Hubbard's like fictional sci-fi novels, which he wrote. One of them caught my eye. Um, Battlefield Earth is like L. Ron Hubbard's most well-known fictional novel which is also has been made into a movie like decades ago, starring freaking John Travolta. The movie has been panned as a, an awful, awful failure and is well known for being that. The book, however, is something that has actually gotten positive attention, although it undoubtedly, from what I gave out, also has Scientology leaning undertones with some toxic uh, ideology baked into the story. Uh, it still is like it is a sci fi story that is somewhat well regarded even by critics. And it is uh, Aaron Hubbard's most um, popular, most well known novel. And I saw it in the shelf with really fancy like uh, cover art and thought, hey, let's, let's check this out. I've heard about this. That's really interesting. And then one of the booth people noticed me, probably was really surprised that somebody was actually interested or whatever. I don't think they got a lot of visitors. It feels like they were really excited about anybody who showed the least bit of interest in their stuff. And so they offered to talk and help out and if I was looking for something or whatever. And I was said, love, I'm fine, I'm, I'm just looking, whatever. And then she said, uh, we can give you some free Battlefield Earth bookmarks. We can't give you the book, but we can give you some bookmarks. And so I said in an excited voice, because I was genuinely excited to get something from, for free from these Scientology people. I would absolutely love that. Thank you. And so I got these um, 
well it's 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 a battlefield earth bookmark uh, which also like the, this is the fancy edition that i was looking at in the shelf i don't know it's, it's a cool cover um and something else Aaron hubbard's oh Aaron hubbard presents writers of the future volume 39 this seems to be like a short story collection that Elron Hubbard has his words, uh, his name on, I don't know, Wait, but I mean, listen man, it even got Brandon Sanderson talking, like, Brandon Sanderson is a big name in fantasy f literature, he's a fan of Elron Hubbard's work, apparently, whatever that means, but yeah, so I got the bookmarks and then put the book back into the shelf and Lala and I went on our ma merry way, we left the booth a couple of seconds later, the Scientology booth lady approached us again, she followed us and uh, had the book in her hand, Battlefield Earth, and said I could have it for free. And I was like, holy shit, are you serious? Are you sure? And she was like, yeah. And I said, thank you very much, this is awesome. And so I walked away with this thick ass, fancy ass, dope looking um edition of battlefield earth without having paid a single cent and if i was ever to read an Elron hubbard book it would have been for free i wouldn't have paid for this anyway and so it is awesome that i grabbed this that they i don't know if they were desperate or whatever maybe they are desperate to leave a positive um a positive impression on anybody who is remotely interested in their stuff honestly Fuck Aaron Hubbard and his nonsense, but the cover art is dope and I might actually put this on my shelf in a way that I can look at this. Though funnily enough, I figured I found this out when I googled this book afterwards, um, there's a part that's photoshopped out. They deleted the boobies from the actual cover art, the original cover art. Which is an interesting thing to note, I guess. But anyway, yeah, and, and I mean, look, this is not Scientology, actually. This is just science fiction novel written by the creator of Scientology. Um, and it has, like, raving reviews, including, again, uh, Brenton Sanderson. And if Brenton Sanderson says this is great fiction, I mean, who's to argue, right? Genuinely though, I might I might actually give this a read if I feel like it Someday I might but uh, Ironically, I was very happy to get this for free But then I thought if I was ever gonna read this this actually big and heavy book I wouldn't read this as a physical book. I would get this on my handy dandy ebook reader anyway So in that sense, I guess I kind of I'm not, never gonna actually use this book so I just noticed if I give them my name and address, if I give the Scientology people my name and address, I get an ebook as well. That's how they get you, man. This is going straight to the USA. I'm in Germany. I'm not paying that uh, postage. <laughs> I'm just gonna pirate an ebook version and then maybe read this book at some point. If I was ever gonna be reading anything by Aaron Hubbard, it would probably be Battlefield Earth. But still, if I'm gonna commit to a... Oh my god, it's a thousand pages? If I'm ever actually gonna commit my brief time on Earth to read these a thousand pages from Scientology founder Aaron Hubbard, it's not gonna be through this book, it's gonna be an ebook. That was our fun little adventure at the book fair and we might be doing this annually from now on. We're gonna try to go get there every year. But yeah, that's it. That is all that happened in October. This is the end and I guess spooky season is coming to a close. Probably already has ended uh, when this video is actually online because I'm late. But here we are. Thanks for listening to my stupendous rambling see you later don't sign up don't sign up with scientology do not sign up for scientology mm -hmm.